Thank you, Janet. And I'd like to welcome everyone uh, on behalf of the Center for Latin American Studies to this webinar this afternoon, Reflections on the U.S. Election and the Chilean Plebiscite. At first glance, this may appear as two separate themes that we've combined in a webinar. They really are not separate themes. There are issues running through both countries and ways of dealing with these issues that inform much of what's happening in the world today. Uh, the election in the United States is defining for the future of this country, still not fully resolved, definitive without question. Uh, the plebiscite in Chile on a new constitution was also a defining moment. And both the election in the US and the plebiscite in Chile emerged from and at the same time as major movements in the streets that were related to the election as well as to the plebiscite. So we very much look forward to exploring each of the themes, but also talking about them together. Our format is straightforward. Each of our presenters uh, will speak uh, with opening remarks to put some ideas on the table. Then we'll have a conversation about the relation of these ideas, the relation of the plebiscite and the election. And then we will go to your questions. Uh, and I will begin by introducing our presenters today. Uh, Paul Pearson is the John Gross Professor of Political Science uh, at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, his teaching and research includes the fields of American politics and public policy, comparative political economy, and social theory. But that doesn't begin to describe who he is or his role. He has become one of the foremost public intellectuals on many of these issues, and the the title of his latest book done with Jacob Hacker at Yale gives an insight into that. Let them eat tweets, how the right rules in an age of extreme inequality. Gabriel Boric is a member of Congress in Chile, uh, representing uh, the region in the far south of Chile, Region 12, Magallanes and Chilean Antarctica, uh, an extraordinary part of the world, uh, far from Santiago to be sure, but his voice has been a critical one in Valparaiso and Santiago. He was elected to Congress in 2013 and reelected in 2017. Prior to that, he served as president of the Student Federation at the Universidad de Chile. He too has been a very prominent and key voice in the political debates in his country nationally, and in particular has played an important role on the plebiscite. So with that, let me turn it over to Paul Pearson. Thanks, Harley. Um, thank you for the introduction. And it's, it's great to be here and um, great to have a chance to have a dialogue with Gabrielle, who I had the pleasure of, of uh, talking with some months ago in, in advance of the plebiscite. And so it's great to, to reconnect and, and explore some of the differences and similarities be between the politics that's going on in these two societies. And um, I want to keep my remarks brief so we have time for a discussion. Um, and um, but but talk about a little bit about what has just unfolded in the United States by noting three broad uh, features of our politics that I think actually uh, we share uh, with Chile, despite the distance and despite um, all the obvious differences. Um, one is um, uh, a very high level of political polarization. All right, so uh, with. Uh, with now a pretty long history, uh, but in the in the United States, I would say especially uh, since the 19 early 1990s, with the rise 
of Newt Gingrich and a new kind of Republican Party. Um, uh, we've uh, marched fairly quickly towards a much more polarized society uh, that sees uh, two political tribes um, and on both sides a sense that, um, uh, that the stakes of politics have greatly increased. Uh, the sense that the other side uh, is not just the opposition, but an enemy um, has become much more pronounced uh, in American politics. Um, the second feature is um, a, a constitution with an unusual combination of factors, uh, features um, that in the American case is of course very old um, and um, partly for intended reasons, but I think largely now for unintended reasons um, has um, favored one side in that political conflict. I'll say a little bit more about this uh, in a minute. Um, and um, it makes it hard for popular majorities to actually translate their views into um, effective governance. Um, and then the third, uh, I think, similarity, though, I think we're at different places in this story. Uh, the third similarity is an experience with what uh, students of comparative politics now call democratic backsliding. Uh, the idea um, that the quality of a democracy can gradually erode, um, particularly if it is undermined by political elites um, in a context where society is highly polarized and where constitutional arrangements uh, perhaps create openings for that kind of democratic backsliding. And of course, in the US, uh, this last concern has really come to the fore um, in the past four years with the election of Donald Trump, um, a completely unprecedented kind of figure in American politics, a right-wing populist, uh, who I think is, one can say in a nonpartisan way, um, has engaged in um, the practices, both the rhetoric and the practices of a would-be authoritarian um, and has done whatever he could um, to bring the power of the government, what he calls the deep state, but extending also to the courts and parts of the media uh, in such a way that it would empower uh, not just Republicans, but Donald Trump personally uh, in our politics. And so we went into this last election uh, with the three things that I've talked about as a backdrop. And I think there were three, broadly three possible results that could have come from the election. The first, which is what the polls uh, largely anticipated that we would get, uh, was going to be a repudiation of the Trump presidency, uh, a blue wave, as we call it here, uh, in which Democrats would not only capture the White House, but strengthen their majority in the House of Representatives and take control of the US Senate, perhaps only narrowly, but take control of the Senate in a way that would allow them to pursue a fairly ambitious program of um, policy and political reform, democratizing reforms. Um, that didn't happen. Um, the second possibility uh, was um, a vindication of President Trump, uh, his reelection, uh, which I think likely would have accelerated the trends uh, towards democratic backsliding, which had been evident in the United States uh, in the past four years. It would have given him four more years uh, to appoint friendly judges uh, to fill the national security apparatus and the law enforcement apparatus nationally uh, with people loyal to him. Uh, it would have given him four more years uh, to exercise um, uh, pressure on uh, political media in a way that would have strengthened his position. Uh, and I think there were a lot of reasons why um, one, could, one could have expected something like the outcomes that we've observed in countries like Hungary and Poland in recent years to have played out in the United States. That didn't happen either, right? Uh, because it's clear now that uh, that Donald Trump lost the election, and I expect that he will leave office uh, on January 20th. The third option is what we got, um, which was a shift towards the Democrats, 
that was strong enough to put uh, uh, Joseph Biden in the White House, but not strong enough to give him a legislative majority that he could work with um, and produce uh, significant political and policy reforms that might have gotten us out of uh, the impasse that's partly been created by our constitutional arrangements. Uh, the election was, uh, in the words of the journalist Ron Brownstein, the Antietam election. Uh, Antietam, a famous and bloody battle in the Civil War in which both sides uh, mobilized all their resources and battled uh, to an inconclusive result. Um, and in, in fact, we did see extraordinary political mobilization uh, on both sides uh, and the level to which uh, the uh, Trump Republicans were able to get out their voters, I think caught pollsters by surprise. Maybe we'll talk about that. Probably we don't have time uh, to talk about it. But the result was a super high turnout election in which Democrats just increased their vote share enough uh, to push Biden over the finish line, but not to deliver the victories that they needed uh, in the United States Senate. So that leaves us obviously in a significantly altered position. It is no small thing uh, to remove a would-be autocrat from power. Um, but all the things that I described at the outset, um, a highly polarized political environment, a constitutional arrangement which is highly skewed towards um, non-urban, um, uh, the non-urban political coalition in American politics. Uh, just one striking statistic uh, that I think indicates where, where we are. Democrats have now won seven of the last eight elections, presidential elections in terms of the popular vote, something that has never before happened in American politics. And if you only knew that and knew nothing else about what had happened in the last 30 years, you would think Democrats must be dominating the national political system. They do not dominate the national political system. Republicans, because of the rural bias in the Senate, have been able to hold a majority in the Senate for much of that period and hold it, are likely to hold it now, um, even as they attract uh, the votes of a minority of Americans uh, and represent a minority of Americans in the, uh, from the states uh, where, they, uh, where they are choosing senators. Um, so the Senate is heavily skewed towards the Republican coalition. And even though we think of the Supreme Court as essentially being a reflection of what's happening with the presidency, Democrats have won the popular vote seven out of the eight, eight last times, but the very powerful American Supreme Court has a six to three Republican majority. Right? Um, so the way in which our constitutional arrangements intersect with our polarized politics, which pit a favored rural-based coalition against a disfavored urban-based coalition, even if it is slightly larger numerically, is just a fundamental part of our, our politics and remains a fundamental part of our politics um, after, after the November election. Um, Looking forward, I think we can expect a continuation of trench warfare. It makes a big difference uh, that Joe Biden will re replace Donald Trump in the White House. Uh, but the hopes of many that there would have been an opportunity for democratic revitalization to address some of the deep, deep uh, flaws, I think, uh, that characterize our contemporary constitution and the way in which it intersects with the political coalitions that exist at the moment, that's off the table uh, given the results of the election. Uh, so we find ourselves in a stalemate and a highly polarized stalemate uh, as we look forward. Uh, so as we look to the South in this conversation and we see a country in the midst of wrestling with the excitement of constitutional reform I think many who value, who prize democracy in the United States are looking with not a little bit of envy. Uh, and so I'm eager to hear uh, Gabriel's comments on the, the situation uh, in Chile. Thank you, Paul. 
Uh, Gabrielle, we now turn to you. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to start um, with some brief um, readings in, in English, and then I'm going to switch to to Spanish. Um, uh, first of all, I, I want to thank uh, class, you, Harley, Shaken, uh, Beatriz Mas, of course, Janet, and all the class team for giving me this opportunity to talk to you, even though we are so far away. Um, it's really an honor to have a debate with, with Paul in, in this instance. Uh, but Paul, uh, I want to tell you that you have a depth uh, because when I was like doing some research for for this dialogue, I couldn't find I couldn't found any of your books translated to Spanish, uh, and we are like we are really looking forward to read some I don't know uh, let them let them in tweets American Abinesha, uh winner takes all or some of your works because there's a lot of people here in Chile that are that are wondering what is going on in the states. And um, we are like used to read some uh, news or some um, posts in blogs, but not like a, a deep reflex reflection about uh, how this could happen, how what's been going on uh, could happen. And we get we are guessing uh, that it's not only the four last years, but uh, the path that led you uh, to what you're living what you lived the last four years, it's a little bit longer than that. And uh, so please talk to your um, editorial house uh, or something to tra please translate your books to Spanish because we're really looking forward to read them. Um, also, um, it's very interesting uh, uh, your reflections about inequality um, and on how inequality increases polarization in the political system. And that's a topic that has been very controverted uh, here in Chile. And I think that it's in the core of the, the social upheaval that uh, we've had had in the recent months here in, in our country that led us to the plebiscite that the last 25 of October um, asked all the Chilean people uh, if we wanted or not another co a new constitution. Um, and we voted yes, we want a new constitution. Um, so. After this uh, brief uh, introduction, um, I'm going to switch to Spanish to do because my English is not that accurate or not that um, good to do a, 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 an academic conference. Um, so I'm switching now for the translators. Um, ¿Qué es lo que ha sucedido en Chile que nos llevó a este plebiscito histórico para terminar? para preguntarle a los chilenos si es que queríamos terminar con la constitución heredada de la dictadura de, 1970, de 1980, la constitución de 1980. Yo creo que hay que remontarse un poquitito más atrás. Y eh, me gustaría partir con una cita que, que es muy atingente a las reflexiones que eh, Paul ha, ha hecho en su trabajo, que es de un libro de Aníbal Pinto Santa Cruz. Este libro se llama Chile, eh, un, Chile un caso de desarrollo frustrado, y fue escrito en 1958. Y en su introducción, Aníbal Pinto Santa Cruz nos decía lo siguiente, cito. La gran contradicción del desarrollo chileno es la que se viene planteando desde hace mucho tiempo entre el ritmo deficiente de la expansión de su economía y el desarrollo del sistema y las sociedades democráticas. Tal contradicción ya la había deslumbrado Francisco Antonio Encina, pero no hay duda que con el último tiempo se ha venido agravando y quizás se aproxime a un punto de ruptura. Como lo anotamos en otras páginas, el desequilibrio tendrá que romperse o con una ampliación sustancial de la capacidad productiva y un progreso en la distribución del producto social y del ingreso, o por un ataque franco contra las condiciones de vida democrática que en esencia son incompatibles con una economía estancada. ¿Por qué hago esta referencia a Aníbal, a Aníbal Pinto Santa Cruz de esta cita de 1958? Porque desgraciadamente su advertencia no fue tomada en cuenta en particular por las élites de nuestro país y la contradicción terminó resolviéndose por un ataque franco a las condiciones de vida democrática 
que se materializó en el golpe de Estado cívico-militar del de 11 de septiembre de 1973. No pretendo acá, para todos quienes escuchan, hacer una, un repaso de la historia de Chile, sino solo señalar que esta contradicción entre expansión económica, distribución del ingreso y condiciones de la vida democrática es imperativa a resolver. Y una vez recuperada la democracia en nuestro país en 1990, pareciera que de alguna medida nos olvidamos de esta advertencia. Y nos vimos enfrentados a algo que tuvimos la oportunidad de conversar en Berkeley eh, en febrero, que es un dilema que la socialdemocracia de tercera vía eh, en Chile pareciera haber adoptado de una forma, creo yo, bastante irreflexiva. ¿A qué me refiero? Al segundo principio de justicia de John Rawls, que nos señala que las desigualdades se justifican en la medida en que vayan en beneficio de los más desfavorecidos. Y por lo tanto, en concreto, eso significó que el, el problema de la desigualdad eh, ha resultado ser un problema relevante para la izquierda, porque se ha utilizado como una suerte de justificación moral para el crecimiento económico como prioridad política y la focalización del gasto como respuesta a la pobreza. Incluso nos llegaron a decir de que la desigualdad en Chile, en términos del Gini, había disminuido. Lo cierto es que en los últimos años hemos alcanzado los niveles de desigualdad que teníamos en 1970. Antes estábamos mucho más altos que eso incluso. Pero siguen siendo niveles de desigualdad muy altos. Eh, y, y se genera un problema que es tramposo, porque los datos nos dicen, según el, el PNUD, eh, el, el, la, la Agencia de, de, de la Organización de Naciones Unidas, que es posible que la desigualdad, al ser una medida esencialmente relativa, se reduzca, aunque la distancia absoluta entre los hogares del 0,1, 1 y 10% más rico respecto de todo el resto de la población, aumenten. Y ese es un problema que es grave, que la política chilena no fue, no, no, no solo no fue capaz de enfrentar, sino que, como se dijo durante mucho tiempo en los últimos meses, no lo vio venir. Y se generó un desacoplamiento importante entre las condiciones de reproducción de la vida de la mayoría de los chilenos y chilenas y la élite que los gobernaba. Entonces, a propósito del conservative dilema que plantea Paul en, en, en su libro, de cómo hacen los partidos conservadores o los, partid los partidos conservadores de derecha para encantar un electorado si es que sus políticas van en contra de lo que beneficia, sus políticas económicas, van en contra de lo que beneficia a la mayoría de ese electorado. Bueno, eh, Paul nos dice de que buscan o acercarse al centro, como, habrán, eh, como hicieron los Tories ingleses eh, en, en, a fines del siglo XIX, principios de, de, del siglo XX, o bien instalan otros clivajes que dividan a la sociedad, ya sea de raza, religión, eh, derechos civiles u, u, otro, de, eh, u otros, que hagan olvidar lo prioritario de la agenda económica. Y ahí, en Chile, yo diría, a, tratando de hacer un paralelo con lo que sucedió en Estados Unidos, tenemos un conservative dilema expandido. ¿En qué sentido? Que las, las élites, durante los últimos 30 años, de una u otra manera se fueron fundiendo en una sola cosa, lo que en, en términos populistas, eh, en po populistas de Chantal Mouffe, eh, algunos han llamado, o, o Ernesto Lacla, Laclau, algunos han llamado como la casta. ¿A qué me refiero con esto? A que la élite política chilena se volvió indiferenciable, ya sea de izquierda o de derecha. Y eso tiene mucho que ver con el diseño institucional chileno, con el tipo de constitución, con el tipo de cerrojos y trabas institucionales que hacían que la voluntad de una mayoría, tal como al parecer pasa en Estados Unidos eh, mediante, el, mediante diferentes mecanismos, fuera imposible de ser expresada políticamente. Jaime Guzmán, el autor intelectual de la Constitución de 1980, decía que tenemos que tener un sistema que permita que aunque los nosotros perdamos, nuestro adversario no puede hacer algo muy diferente de lo que nosotros haríamos. Y eso 
terminó por volver la política en algún sentido irrelevante, pero además generando una distancia social muy grande entre la política institucional y la mayoría de Chile. Y eso funcionaba para las élites en la medida en que, uno, había crecimiento, y un crecimiento que sea, que sea percibible, pero cuando hay algún tipo de crisis económica o mayor organización social, esa burbuja revienta. Y creo yo que eso fue lo que pasó en Chile. Las condiciones de crecimiento sin desarrollo se estancaron, y por otro lado, la organización de la sociedad civil y de los movimientos sociales fue increciendo, desapegándose de la élite política. Cuando hablo de la élite política hoy día, yo como parlamentario me sitúo en ella y creo que es parte del problema que tenemos que enfrentar porque desgraciadamente uno de los temas que tenemos en Chile es que eh, del, de la gran movilización social que hubo desde octubre del año pasado no han emergido liderazgos reconocibles porque hay una aversión hacia el liderazgo vertical y por lo tanto la manera en cómo encauzar hoy día los cambios que la sociedad chilena está reclamando es más bien incierta. Y creo que la única manera de llevarlo adelante y afrontarlo es con una amplia participación social y en donde las élites, no solamente las conservadoras, sino las élites políticas, institucionales, económicas, eh, en general, cedan poder. Quizás que lo veo más claro y con esto termino, Harley, eh, quizás que, que lo intuyó con un sentido común bastante interesante, fue la primera dama actual, la esposa del presidente Piñera, Cecilia Morel, quien en un audio que se filtró durante las protestas, decía, le decía a una amiga, no sabemos qué es lo que está pasando, parece una invasión alienígena, refiriéndose a las protestas. Sin embargo, lo que concluía ella es que vamos a tener que compartir nuestros privilegios. Y eso, ese compartir nuestros privilegios, es algo a lo que las élites chilenas que se han ido concentrando de una manera parecida a la que ha ido pasando en Estados Unidos, no han querido entender. Y nosotros optamos por una vía institucional de resolverlo, que fue el plebiscito. Pero aún así se están poniendo muchas trabas para que el proceso constituyente sea efectivamente participativo. Si no logramos, desde la política y los movimientos sociales, llegar a un punto de entendimiento en donde la polarización encuentre un cauce institucional, yo creo que podríamos anticiparnos a otro eh, franco ataque a las condiciones de vida democrática y creo que ahí está el principal, de la, el principal desafío de la política hoy día. Uno, convencer a las élites que hay que compartir los privilegios. Dos, hacer del proceso constituyente uno realmente participativo de la sociedad civil organizada que se ha generado a través de todo Chile en los últimos, en los últimos meses. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Gabriel. Uh... Both of you have raised, I think, some insightful and provocative points. Paul, I'd like to ask you uh, what you might uh, ask of Gabriel based on his presentation. Oh, well, it's a, it was a wonderful presentation. Um, and it, it certainly made me realize that I, I should have noted the fourth similarity uh in our in our settings especially it's it's central to um the work that i've been doing with jacob in recent years you know we're talking about two of the most unequal societies in the western hemisphere um and and knowing the depth of that inequality really does help us to understand i think where where democracy is fragile um why things become polarized, uh, why they become polarized uh, in a particular way. And it's, it's a little hard to imagine um, uh, getting to a better place without confronting that inequality in some serious way. Um, but as you, as you pointed out, and I think this is the big challenge in both countries, right, is um, how do you open up the political system to allow for really needed social reforms, social and economic reforms, but without doing so in a way that makes the privileged feel so threatened um, that, um, uh, that they rebel against what you're doing um, because they're very powerful, right? And, um, and because they, 
and certainly in the United States, it's true that they have excelled at mobilizing voters around other things besides economics and uh, convincing many voters that um, that they should fear, you know, that they should fear those who are pushing for economic reform. Um, so, so this is just this is a deep, it's a fundamental challenge in democracy, right? And and so I would just be interested in hearing a little more about how progressives in, in Chile are thinking about the need to create a, a constitutional order in which you can pursue social justice and greater equality, but in a way that is not going to be so frightening to elites that it, that it jeopardizes the system. I think this has always been the fundamental question about democracy, um, but it, it's particularly challenging uh, when you're dealing with constitutional reform and when you're uh, dealing within the context of a society that is so very unequal. Gabriel. Can I answer now? Sure. Um, esa combinación de cambios sociales sin eh, jeopardize eh, the, the economic elites pero además eh, haciendo parte al pueblo que se ha movilizado y que sienta que se está avanzando efectivamente es un equilibrio muy muy complejo que no se va a lograr solamente con el texto constitucional el proceso constituyente va más allá de la letra que escribamos en nuestra constitución es un proceso que tiene que ver con distribución de o sea generar instituciones que permitan una justa, una más justa redistribución de la riqueza. Mejorar los canales de participación política, pero a su vez asegurar los contrapesos que permitan un equilibrio entre los diferentes poderes que hoy día, la, eh, hoy día en Chile la cancha está demasiado inclinada para el lado de las élites. Eso implica necesariamente que las élites entiendan o entendamos que tenemos que ceder poder. Los partidos políticos, los grupos empresariales, los grandes medios de comunicación, porque eh, es la única condición posible para que haya paz social. Ahora, yo estoy muy disponible para discutir la velocidad de esos cambios, en la vida en que tengamos un consenso respecto a la dirección. Podemos discutir velocidades, pero no podemos continuar en la lógica gatopardista que se impuso durante mucho tiempo en Chile de cambiar algo para que todo siga igual. ¿Qué es lo que significa eso en concreto? Restablecer ciertos derechos sociales que deben estar por fuera del campo del mercado. Eh, Michael Walser en, en, en las esferas de la justicia hablaba de justamente ciertas esferas de la vida pública que están por fuera de la, trans, de, de, de la transacción económica. Eh, se ha escrito mucho respecto a eso, en Chile estamos muy, atras, muy atrasados, y como ustedes saben, fuimos los eh, Guinea Pigs, eh, eh, conejillo de Indias, del de sistema neoliberal y de, lo que, de, lo, de los Neocon, eh, de los, eh, ne o, o Chicago Boys, eh, en el mundo. Y por lo tanto tenemos mucho camino que andar. Pero creo que es importante que demos señales claras de que las pensiones, la salud, la educación, avanzar también hacia la vivienda y otras cuestiones eh, importantes van a salir de las esferas del mercado y de la focalización del gasto y van a pasar a ser derechos universales. ¿Eso implica ceder privilegios? Sí, pero implica también una mayor concepción de comunidad. Y eso es importante, una mayor concepción de comunidad. El problema gigante que tenemos en Chile es que el nivel de segregación es tan grande que no nos entendemos parte de un mismo país. Y eso da pie, y con esto termino Harley, a los sectores más conservadores de instalar ciertas cuñas a propósito del conservative dilema que hablaba, que, de que hablaba Paul, que nos termina dividiendo a quienes queremos avanzar, por ejemplo, eh, queremos avanzar hacia una sociedad más justa. Por ejemplo, en temas de la inmigración, en temas étnicos, eh, en temas, eh, por cierto, religiosos, no tanto en Chile ya, pero, pero en otros temas de esas características. 
Así que ahí tenemos un tremendo desafío. No es fácil, pero la izquierda debe mostrar, como decía Eric Olin Wright en, en su texto eh, La brújula socialista, tiene que ser capaz de mostrar convicción, idealismo y eficacia. Eficacia en los cambios que propone. No puede ser solamente voluntad. Tiene que tener también un camino claro. Gabriel, uh, Paul, uh, I was going to ask Gabriel if he had a question for you. Sure. Um, Paul, in, in, in your book, you, um, um, you make a, um, an, an analogy about what happened in Germany in the early 30s with the conservative parties or the right wing uh, parties. And I was wondering how do you um, how do you think the 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 world that emerged after World War II? Uh, I mean the like the Human Rights Declaration of 1948, um, all the inter-American system, the NU, etc. Um, is it is it strong enough to resist? Um, uh, like populist crisis uh, that or, or an extreme polarization of the conservative parties that may uh, like um, make explode the democracy in uh, main countries as the United States or maybe France or um, I don't know England maybe or some of that is the the uh, the like the world prepared and strong enough to resist nowadays after World War II uh, that that like wave. That is that is a great question, um, and I think I think there's a lot of reason to be worried about that, frankly. Um, You know, I think we're pretty far down the road of erosion of those institutions and their capacity, you know, which was always limited, but I think you're right to point to it because I do think it's an example of the kinds of compromise institutions that you can get that allow um, for arrangements that are beneficial to a lot of different parties, potentially. I don't mean political parties, I mean a lot of a lot of different interests in a society or across societies. And of course, even in their heyday, they worked imperfectly. Um, they didn't spread their benefits equally at all, um, but, um, but they did create a situation where you could imagine a variety of actors saying, you know, um, we do better by working within these institutions than we would do outside of them. Um, but most of those, and I think when I was first studying politics, we took a lot of those institutional arrangements for granted. We thought that was the way, uh, that was what the world was moving towards. Where we are now, it looks much more like maybe that was a relatively brief, exceptional period, right? Um, where uh, there was more, in the, U in the US case, it meant uh, labor unions actually got a say um, in Uh, crucial issues of social and economic governance. It meant that there was room for bipartisanship. Um, it meant that inequality was lower. Um, now, of course, there are a lot of terrible things about uh, the American society in, in, that, in those years, but those kinds of institutions did create an opportunity to sort of negotiate uh, mutually beneficial reforms, um, but they have really eroded. Um, Uh, in, in most countries, I think, uh, certainly in the United States. Um, and in some ways it links back to what you were saying before about um, economic elites and how economic elites, um, we would be better off if we could persuade economic elites that a lot of what is going on with the intense inequality is actually not in their long-term interests, right? Um, it, is, it is in their long-term interests to have a society that is more prosperous, um, that um, keeps uh, its population healthy, 
um, that educates its children, right? Um, and uh, that has decent public infrastructure, right? These things are, in the American case, I would say these are things that would be good for American capitalism, right? Um, but they would require some sacrifices in the short term from American capitalists. Um, and um, those old institutions, I think, encouraged some of those compromises. Uh, but I worry that we are having a very, very hard time holding on to them now in a context where individual ca capitalists or individual companies maybe don't feel so much loyalty to any particular location, right? They're not thinking about the long-term health of any particular society. Um, and so to bring them to the table, I think political pressure is, is, has to be a part of that formula. Popular pressure has to be a part of that formula. I'm not convinced that just um, uh, their own wisdom and farsightedness is going to bring them to that kind of conclusion, even though I do think it would be good for American capitalism or Chilean capitalism uh, if they recognize the costs of um, intense inequality. Uh, thank you. Paul, in your opening remarks, uh, you spoke about uh, the antecedents of the Trump administration. It didn't simply appear out of nothing. And you specifically mentioned Newt Gingrich and the Republicans in the 1990s, the Contract for America, Gingrich being speaker, and a ruthlessness as well as an ideology that became defining in important ways. So I like that antecedent to Trumpism. I'd like to ask the question to Gabrielle, uh, and this comes from uh, Beatrice in Berkeley. How important were the high school student demonstrations followed by increasingly broader and larger demonstrations before in Chile to the plebiscite process that we're going through now? Las, la, las movilizaciones sociales, tanto del año 2006, uh, from high school students, and uh, 2011, the university or college students, fueron muy importantes porque por primera vez desde el retorno a la democracia, fueron movilizaciones que cuestionaron o apuntaron más allá de reivindicaciones propias. En el fondo dijeron, queremos no solamente una mejor educación, queremos no solamente más becas o gratuidad, queremos cambiar el sistema, queremos terminar con el lucro, con algo que entendemos que es un derecho, en este caso la educación. Pero para eso, decíamos los estudiantes en el, el 2011, tenemos que hacer una reforma tributaria para que los ricos paguen más. Entonces, esas movilizaciones, en particular la del 2011, que fueron adquiriendo independencia de los partidos políticos, mostraron eh, el, el great abyss that existed in, que existe entre la política institucional y los, los movimientos sociales que se criaron ya en democracia, que se formaron en democracia. Y ahí sucede un fenómeno que es muy particular. La generación del 2011 no tiene un diálogo con las generaciones que las precedieron. Y eso genera un problema, que es, creo yo, y yo soy parte de esa generación, la falta de conciencia histórica y la creencia de que es posible inventar el mundo en una sola generación. Eso yo creo que es un problema grave. Y es un problema cuya responsabilidad es, por cierto, compartida. Pero que los movimientos sociales tienen que enfrentar. Porque con puro voluntarismo no se puede cambiar el mundo. Se requiere instituciones y sentido y conciencia histórica. Y por eso creo, además, que debates como este o los trabajos que, que, que Paul ha hecho sobre la desigualdad y sobre lo, los, tiempos de, de, los tiempos políticos son tremendamente relevantes y nos pueden dar muchas luces 
respecto del proceso que se está viviendo en Chile. Por lo tanto, esas movilizaciones han sido relevantes, pero también hay que decir que las movilizaciones del año pasado hoy día no reconocen titularidad en ningún partido político. Y ese es un tema que los partidos políticos tenemos que enfrentar eh, de manera no solamente reaccionaria, no solamente eh, negando los movimientos sociales, sino buscando más bien cómo dialogar con este nuevo tipo de movimientos sociales que no se reconocen en ningún partido. Yo creo que es el principal desafío que tenemos quienes estamos en política institucional en estos días. To follow up on that with you, Paul, we have a question uh, uh, from Tasha in Berkeley. What role can civil society play to ensure a smooth transition in a Biden administration in light of Trump's actions? And actually, I'd add a part B to Tasha's question. What role might you foresee for civil society in the early days and onward of a Biden administration? Well, that's a huge question. Um, uh, let me talk about the transition first. Um, I, 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 I would say at this point, I, I'm gradually getting less worried about the, the transition. Um, I think um, the uh, my big fear was um, the prospect that the courts um, would get actively uh, the, the, some kind of pretext would exist that it would allow the courts to get sufficiently involved. And I do feel like this has been part of democratic backsliding in the U.S. that the courts have become increasingly partisan, especially at the higher levels. Um, and, you know, so one could imagine scenarios there um, that, that, that would have been uh, pretty frightening. Um, but that seems unlike, I think, I think Biden's victory was clean enough and decisive enough on, in multiple sites um, that that seems very unlikely to uh, happen. I think that we should stay vigilant, um, um, uh, but, um, but I'm less worried about that, though I, Though I say that, you know, the backdrop with respect to the question is, it is astonishing that we've reached a point in our society where the question even needs to be asked, right? And where uh, the losing candidate in a presidential election is claiming that the election was stolen and basically none of his co-partisans, elite co-partisans uh, will object to that. Um, That is a, a very ugly development in American society, and it points to the long-term challenge uh, that we face um, that will not go away uh, the day that um, Donald Trump is removed um, from the White House. Um, moving forward, I think the challenge, I, I think the Biden administration is facing an enormous challenge. Um, uh, sitting in a institutional environment and a political context uh, that is going to make it very, make, it's going to make life very, very difficult for them. Um, the Senate is likely to remain in Republican hands. Uh, Mitch McConnell learned in 2009 um, that um, obstruction um, and uh, outrage and the generation of conflict paid Uh, given the American political system that Republicans benefited from that. They have very little incentive to offer any cooperation uh, to uh, Biden and the Democrats, even with the pressing problems that we're facing. And indeed, I think the evidence is clear that they're terrified of their own political base uh, and, um, and of uh, Donald Trump, who will still be an enormously powerful voice in our politics, even Uh, even once he loses the presidency. I think that's, that's likely, though the, the specific contours are hard to predict. Um, so Biden is going to be in a very tough uh, position. And so those who are um, eager for political and policy reform are going to need to decide how hard to push him uh, and how much um, 
uh, how much to express their anger uh, when he disappoints them. Um, and some pressure and anger is appropriate, um, but I think, and probably necessary to drive change. Um, but I, I think in this context, it is an extremely delicate balancing act. Um, uh, it is likely given the outcome of this Antietam election uh, that Democrats um, are going to lose Congress in 2022. Um, uh, again, it's hard to predict what's gonna be going on two years from now, um, but most of what I've learned about American politics suggests uh, that their very thin majority in the House is likely to be quite vulnerable in the first midterm election, especially if people are disappointed in the president. Um, so, and the Senate, same story. Um, so um, I, I think the outcome of the election has got to be a big disappointment uh, to progressives who were hoping uh, to deal more seriously with the very, very serious challenges that American society faces. Um, but people have to recognize the reality um, and, um, and, and pick their battles uh, carefully. Thank you. Uh, this next question is from an anonymous attendee. Uh, and I'd like both of you to com comment it. And Gabrielle, if you could perhaps begin, and then Paul, if you could also comment on it. Uh, and the question is, isn't there a contradiction that high school educated voters favored the party that did not want to deal with economic inequality in the US uh, but the working classes in Chile were in support of addressing that inequality. What went into that very contradictory set of results? Gabrielle. Hmm. Uh, first question, what, why do you say that the, um, the like the middle class or the working class in Chile addresses the, the party that didn't want to face the, the inequality. Do, do you mean like the Piñera selection? Or maybe I got wrong the, the question, Harley? Uh, I, I think uh, what, uh, what the questioner was looking at is workers in the United States, those without a college education in particular, mm -hmm. went for a, a party and a president that absolutely was going nowhere near addressing inequality, yet workers in Chile embraced the notion of changes whether explicitly oh, okay. or implied, uh, meaning why are workers, particularly at the low end of the income scale in one country embracing the Trump alternative, whereas mm -hmm. in Chile, these workers are embracing more fundamental change and beyond given the 80% uh, margin or 80% majority mm -hmm. in favor of the plebiscite. Okay, I, I get it. Um, bueno, primero es, es difícil entregarle un solo significado o un significado demasiado claro al 80% que votó por una nueva constitución. Nuestra tesis, la tesis de la izquierda, es que efectivamente esa mayoría votó por transformaciones sociales estructurales. Sin embargo, no podemos olvidar que solo hace tres años una mayoría de chilenos de quienes votaron lo hicieron por un presidente que tal como Trump en este caso Sebastián Piñera prometía y lo intentó bajarle los impuestos a los más ricos del país entonces eh, la no me atrevería a decir que existe una dirección clara o una eh, convicción arraigada en 
eh, las clases sociales chilenas para avanzar hacia un lugar u otro. Es algo que está en disputa. Hace tres años fueron por la opción de derecha, que hablaba de crecimiento económico, en contra de la inmigración, a favor del orden público, o, o eh, poniendo mucho énfasis en el orden público, y hoy día, después de las protestas, la mayoría de los chilenos se inclina por transformaciones. ¿Qué transformaciones van a ser esas? Es algo que está en disputa, y ahí yo espero que las élites de nuestro país, representadas por la derecha política, pero particularmente quienes están en los poderes económicos, entiendan que van a tener que ceder privilegios. Porque si no lo entienden, y si es que no hay una, eh, una muestra clara de que se está avanzando en la dirección de reducir la desigualdad, no tengo ninguna duda que el camino institucional por el que optamos se va a ver severamente cuestionado al no obtener resultados. Cuando es, es como lo que le pasó a la... Es, es un ejemplo quizás requiere más contexto, pero la sociedad de las naciones del de periodo de entreguerras fracasó porque no fue capaz de procesar los conflictos que había en el mundo de posguerra. Si el camino institucional por el cual optamos nosotros no es capaz de otorgar una salida institucional al problema de la desigualdad, va a fracasar también. Y eso es algo que uno esperaría que las élites entendieran, que para poder seguir conviviendo y poder tener mayor cohesión social, necesitamos repartir mejor la torta. Thank you, Paul. So um, I was actually on a, another Zoom panel about the election before this one, and uh, one of my colleagues showed um, slides from the exit polls uh, showing you know, the breakdown in the vote by income. And it, it's really important to remember that actually um, a clear majority of the voters making less than 50 or $60,000 a year in the US voted for Joe Biden. Right. So when we say workers voted for Trump, what we really mean is white workers voted for Trump. Um, right. And which is a, a, actually a very different statement um, and and also provides a part of the answer to right, a big part of the answer. Right. Which is and it, and it is true that white working class voters um, have been uh, drifting for a long time towards the Republican Party. Uh, I think the evidence is pretty clear, is, is actually quite clear that, um, that that is driven largely by, yes, their economic frustration, but the way in which a kind of cultural politics has developed on the right, a highly racialized, um, and some, in many cases racialized is too polite a word, racist politics, right, um, of the kind of classic form, right, that, that, that um, people on the right often use uh, to divide voters who would otherwise share economic interests uh, and try to pursue them through politics, right? So in a way, there's nothing really surprising uh, there. I mean, there's, there, there's a conversation to be had if we had more time about um, what Democrats can do Uh, to try to appeal uh, to these voters better. Um, you know, nominating people like Joe Biden helped a little bit, right? Um, not racially threatening to these voters, um, not culturally threatening to these voters in many ways, but most of them still stayed with, with Donald Trump because they've now bought into a kind of identity, you know, white ethnic identity politics, also a kind of masculine, a certain kind of masculine politics. You know, I think that's You know, another place where, um, where Trump uh, made inroads apparently was among um, uh, Latino, Latino voters, Latino men probably, um, and black men. Um, and, you know, still majorities of them, you know, big majorities in the case of black men voting, voting for uh, Biden, but, uh, but a significant increase um, for, uh, for Trump in voters on that side. So, but it's, so, 
the 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 politics of race and class is intertwined in comp very complicated ways now in the U.S. as cultural issues have been kind of pushed to the forefront in our politics, even even with all this acute economic distress. Thank you. Uh, Gabrielle, this question is directed to you uh, and it follows up on what you were speaking a moment ago. It's from Jorge. Uh, what concrete changes would you think the Constitution of Chile needs and what must be in the new Constitution? Ojalá pronto en Chile nos pongamos a hablar no solo de procedimientos ni de elecciones, sino también de contenidos. ¿Qué es concretamente lo que queremos cambiar de esta nueva constitución que vamos a escribir desde una hoja en blanco? O sea, no atada a la constitución de la dictadura. Yo diría eh, tres cosas fundamentales. En primer lugar, es imperativo, desde mi punto de vista, terminar con la noción de Estado subsidiario, que no está textual en la Constitución, pero que toda su normativa apunta hacia allá, y pasar a un Estado garante de derechos sociales universales. Ese proceso va, tiene que ir más allá del proceso constitucional, y está atado también al crecimiento económico y a la distribución del ingreso pero la Constitución debe entender los derechos sociales como algo inherente a toda persona que viva en Chile, sin importar su clase, condición, y terminar con esta lógica subsidiaria y de focalización y de privatización de los derechos sociales. Eso es uno. En segundo lugar, me parece fundamental, que esto es un tema más específico, pero dejar de concebir a Chile como un Estado unitario y centralista. Eso significa que tenemos que des, no solamente desconcentrar y redistribuir la riqueza, sino desconcentrar y redistribuir el poder en términos territoriales. Uno de los principales obstáculos para el desarrollo de Chile es el centralismo en donde hoy día la capital, Santiago, concentra la gran mayoría de las oportunidades para, y, y justamente, y, y, y las ciudades, también las, las grandes ciudades, Valparaíso, Concepción eh, y Santiago, generan una suerte de, eh, de, de atracción fatal para la concentración de población a costa del desarrollo del de resto del territorio nacional. Yo esto siempre lo digo, pero yo represento a una región que es la más extensa territorialmente de Chile, pero que sin embargo es de las con menores población. Y eso es producto no del clima, es producto principalmente de una mala política de desconcentración del poder. Yo creo que eso es la descentralización es fundamental. Y en tercer lugar, por solo nombrar algunas, evidentemente hay muchas más, entender de que en Chile conviven muchos pueblos y no uno solo. Lo que significa entender y asumir de que nuestro país es multicultural, tanto respecto a los pueblos originarios, las primeras naciones, que han sido ninguneados, eh, han sido criminalizados y han sido reprimidos durante demasiados años, como también respecto a la inmigración que va a ser un fenómeno eh, cada vez más importante y en el cual tenemos que ponernos de acuerdo a nivel regional. No basta con tener una política migratoria solo a nivel de Chile. Hay que tener una política migratoria a nivel regional y una mayor cooperación entre países que hoy día, a nivel de América Latina, existe muy poco. Entonces, derechos sociales en vez de Estado subsidiario, descentralización y multiculturalidad de nuestro país. Thank you. Uh, the next question is really for both of you, but Paul, why don't we start with you? Uh, and this is from Bob in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, doesn't history show us that elites will never agree to real changes 
for a fairer society unless they feel that they are in danger of losing all they have. I remember the alleged statement of the very wealthy Joe Kennedy, the father of President Kennedy, quote, I would rather lose half of what I have than lose it all, end quote. So a popular mass movement must make them realize they are in jeopardy of losing all. Is that the case? Paul, and then Gabrielle. I, I love that Joe Kennedy quote. I've never, I've never heard that before. I wanna find out whether, that, whether that's real um, so, I can, <laughs> so I can use it. Um, I, you know, I think it's kind of a Goldilocks problem um, based on, you know, my reading of uh, people who have studied um, the question of democratic stability and instability and the conditions that give rise to, to greater, um, greater equality. Um, there absolutely needs to be pressure from below. Um, I don't think um, you can rely on people to come to some enlightened view without, some, without pressure from below. I think that's very clear. And I think, uh, it, again, if you think about periods in American politics when uh, equality has grown, um, uh, it, came, it came to a significant extent um, from social pressure, um, from the labor movement, from civil rights groups, and so on. Um, at the same time, I think the history of democracy shows um, that elites who feel fearful right, um, are highly inclined to turn to anti-democratic solutions to their problems. Um, and the spread of anti-democratic thinking on the American right at the moment, and it takes various forms, whether it's voter suppression or whether it's comfort with a kind of rhetoric that says, you know, if you just don't count California um, or Milwaukee, you know, we won the vote. Um, you know, that is, uh, that is really dangerous thinking, and uh, it emerges when elites uh, feel um, that they're better served by non-democratic institutions than by democratic institutions. Um, so this may not be a very satisfying answer, but I believe reformers have to recognize, I mean, I'm a, I guess I'm a reformist at heart, but I actually think the historical record justifies that because um, a democracy that produces greater equality um, exists and can be stable in that sweet spot where, yeah, you scare them a little, but you don't you don't scare them a lot, right? Where you where there's where there's pressure building from reform that makes the status quo unsustainable, uh, but at the same time not so much pressure that they feel like what they really need is a non-democratic. Uh, non-democratic solution. And what that means, what that means concretely is you've got to some, find some way to make that moderation credible. Um, and one way you do that, political scientists have argued, uh, is in the way that you design the constitution, right? So that it does not become, um, so that it does have some breaks built into it, right? So that people don't have to feel like if they lose an election, they're going to be expropriated. Right? That's that's actually very dangerous to democracy, um, and and very very dangerous, I think, to creating some kind of stable path towards greater social justice. Thank you, Gabriel. Sí, um, la tal tal como um, como dice Paul la historia nos ha enseñado que sin movilización y organización popular no hay eh, grandes avances en términos de redistribución del poder y la riqueza. Los grandes avances que se consiguieron desde fines del siglo XIX, principios del siglo XX en adelante, han sido principalmente, no por la buena voluntad de las élites que deciden ceder poder, sino producto de movilizaciones y organizaciones 
que finalmente son canalizadas institucionalmente y se acuerdan nuevos pactos sociales. Yo estoy de acuerdo con Paul en que tiene que existir una conciencia histórica respecto a la necesidad de institucionalizar esos cambios. Porque si no, y esto es lo que yo le diría a Bob, Bob King, entiendo, eh, lo que le diría es que, por cierto, es necesario un movimiento popular organizado que esté permanentemente presionando, pero que a su vez entienda que tiene que ser capaz de negociar. Negociar no en el mal sentido de la palabra, no en el sentido de venderse o traicionar las convicciones, sino de buscar puntos de encuentro para que con quienes no piensan igual que nosotros puedan eh, podamos comprendernos como parte de una misma comunidad. Eso hoy día no está sucediendo. En Chile, tal como en Estados Unidos, cada vez más las élites muy concentradas en el poder y la riqueza que introducen eh, social disrupts en el debate público están enfrentadas con una, con una mayoría que a su vez no tiene la suficiente organización, pero que se ven uno a otro como ya no solamente adversarios, sino enemigos. Se requiere organización popular, pero se requiere también capacidad de institucionalizar los avances, y yo creo que esa es una de las virtudes que ha tenido hasta ahora el proceso chileno, que está por demostrarse si es que va a ser capaz de llegar a buen puerto con este resultado del plebiscito del 25 de octubre. Thank you. Unfortunately, we're about out of time, but I'd like to do two things before we conclude. In a moment, I'd like to ask both of you for a brief comment that what you might want to leave, an idea you might want to leave with the participants of the webinar. But before doing that, I want to mention that today we have international participants from France, Brazil, Chile, Colombia. Yes, Gabriel, I'm here. It looks like Professor Chaikin is having some trouble with his internet connection. So I'm going to just take the liberty to end this webinar. It was a pleasure for us to have you. Uh, class is your home, and we're looking forward to have you back, Professor Pearson. and. Congressman Gabriel Boric. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, really enjoyed it. It's great. Thank you very Thank much. You,